Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Emerging MRI Imaging Trends, Dynamic Magic, Magnetic Resonance Imaging. I will now turn the presentation over to our moderator, Dr. Patrick Browning, RADSITE's Chief Medical Officer. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's, I think, going to be exceptionally interesting hour-long roundtable with some very well-known and well-respected leaders in their field. My name is Patrick Browning. I'm a practicing radiologist, and I'm also the Chief Medical Officer for RADSITE which as you all know is an accrediting body that does national outpatient accreditation. I'd like to introduce my co-panelists. First, I'll ask Kevin to introduce himself. Hi, Kevin Oliver, I'm with Simon Med Imaging, but group, and uh, been at MR since the late 80s and just all of the changes we've seen to the point where we're at now, it's been an interesting journey. Thank you, and Judith? Oh. Thank you, Patrick. I'm Judith Turner. I'm with ProScan Teleradiology. We are a network of a 70-man practice owning and operating about 40 imaging centers throughout the U.S. I run the teleradiology division. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. And last but not least, Raymond. Hi, I'm Raymond Freidenstein. I'm a director of clinical practice at Acumen. Um, we are a mobile and fixed site provider of medical imaging. Excellent. And so as everyone can see, our panelists are very experienced in outpatient imaging in a wide variety of aspects of outpatient imaging. So with that said, let's just jump into it. So our first topic is going to be the initials that are on everybody's mind these days, AI. First, um, I'd just like to ask the panelists to describe what they perceive to be AI, and then also give an idea of how it's being used in their various organizations. And whether or not it's actually making money or just saving money or exactly how it's being approached. So, Reagan, why don't I start with you? Sure. Um, so when we talk about AI, when I think about AI, I try to put it in three buckets. Um, so when we're looking at AI itself, um, it's anything that kind of mimics cognitive uh, function. So acts kind of like a human brain, right? Um, I put things in three buckets, AI, um, uh, machine learning, and deep learning. And I think what we're going to see quite a bit of, uh, especially this year in RSNA, uh, is a lot of deep learning, uh, those algorithms that are going to make not only the radiologists uh, work a lot more efficient, but technologists as well. Um, Maybe it's a difficult exam, or uh, maybe it's just trying to get more signal from, uh, from a, a lower field imaging system. Um, all of that kind of dovetails into that whole umbrella of AI. Um, so again, we're gonna see quite a bit of, uh, uh, um, of systems having AI capabilities at RSNA. We've been talking about this for about four to six years. A lot of discussion at each and every RSNA. Um, and we're starting to see more and more efficiencies built in, a lot more standardization, and <clears> we're <throat> going to mitigate our risk, right? So um, when I think of it, like I said, three buckets, uh, a lot more efficiency, uh, protocol development, more standardized, um, uh, workflows definitely standardized. So it's going to help, right? It's going to be a major help, a major lift, especially after kind of crawling out of COVID, uh, may make a, a, a world of difference when it comes to uh, medical imaging, especially at hospitals and imaging centers itself. So it sounds like you're taking the approach of increasing efficiency and standardization as a way to be able to save time and be able to drive more through the system. Right. Yep. That makes exactly. a lot of sense. How about, how about you, Kevin, on the part of... Your... You know, I really agree with Ray. He summed it up as well as you can. My issue with it and experience is, again, and everything, I'll probably go back to this a lot, is based on reimbursement, it seems like a lot of the companies that are developing this stuff to help us, the cost that they want for it sometimes is getting to be a fine line on, on the value of that. How do you get the ROI for that AI, right? That, that's going to be what it comes down to. Yeah, that would be better... And you look at it, but you're, you know, if someone wants 
$40 an exam to post-process it with AI on it for a reading or for to give you some highlights, just like with the CAD stream or something like that, that's using AI to give you a diagnosis. Well, if that's that cost, and then is the radiologist that's reading it, you know, bearing part of that cost, or does it just come from, you know, we do a global billing anyway, so how that comes out of it, and that's my concern is, do the people that are developing this AI, and again, Ray put it in the straight thing with the buckets, you couldn't get it better than that, but is, are they understanding in outpatient imaging how the pricing is going to vary on that, again, to get ROIs that work for us, and, and that's, I think, has to be our point on it, too, and, and hopefully when we discuss with the companies like at the RSNA, that they understand that that's an important part that we have to look at. We don't, you know, a hospital might charge twelve or fourteen hundred dollars. Outpatient imaging doesn't get that, so we have to work within that. So yeah. I want them to have realistic expectations of what outpatient imaging can afford on things, and then make it affordable for outpatient imaging and not treat us in as the same as hospital based. That again, as we know, have higher reimbursement. They have you know, longer times. They don't have to have the efficiencies built in. So yes, it will increase that efficiency, but who bears the cost of it? And, and, and again, where's that ROI at? So. Yeah, great point. And I think you're both sort of sound like you're heading at it from the sort of the business and outpatient imaging perspective of, you know, how do you, how do you make enough money to stay open and keep the lights on? Well, it's great technology and we know we can see the, how good it, how, how well it can help with it, but you still got to put a price on it that, that makes it uh, doable. So I got gotcha. you. And so, from the more radiologist perspective, Judith, how do you see it being able to, I guess, change the way ProScan is doing their business? It's a good question. In 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 theory, it sounds great, but from an interpretation standpoint, the radiologists are still responsible for the final read. So we have not integrated AI into our reading platform, but into the efficiencies of workflow, exactly what the guys were saying. So anything even from PACs to voice rec systems to dictation systems, uh, patient scheduling platforms, interoperability, uh, along those veins is where we're seeing it now. And you know the literature is showing that AI from an interpretation standpoint is could could be very, very useful in the ED through x-rays and more simple studies. But really in the advanced imaging world, it's a little bit hard to standardize that type of stuff. Definitely. So how do you, between the three of you, do you have a consensus as to what the first best application for some of these algorithms might be? Is it going to be creating standardized reports? Is it going to be getting more patients to the machines? Is it going to be helping radiologists make diagnoses? Do you think- Wait, do we have to pick just one? <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody wants more patients in their machines. <clears throat> and understanding that more patients in the machines and having that efficiency, as well as capturing, you know, all the extra bells and whistles on it that, that Kevin and Ray were talking about with- uh, you know, computer-aided detection and extra protocols and extra sequencing. This really increases the burden to the radiologist who I'd mentioned is still responsible for the final report. So that makes that just a little bit problematic. So um, it's interesting. So we always looking as an outpatient imaging center like Kevin and Ray, we're always looking for additional volume of uh, clinically indicated patients to get scanned, always. And we're looking at efficiency on the table because the cost of staffing is continuing to go up. And so, you know, so when we talk about artificial intelligence, can I springboard into maybe remote technologists? What does that look like? So kind of kind of address the staffing challenges that might be in place. So yeah, Kevin, Ray, what are you guys seeing? Well, I think one thing this summer when CMS had their meeting and they came up with uh, where they're gonna start having standalone codes versus now it's always been the 52 modifier or something for adding a like a 3D processing on something. But now they're coming mm -hmm. up with standalone codes, which is going to help with like a heart flow or LMS scanning on a liver for that. That's, you know, the processing is quite expensive. So mm -hmm. once they make that its own exam, and that's where it's at, I, I think it was approved and that should come in in 2023, then that's going to help them make a big difference that's integrating if we're being able to charge for that. So again, if you have a company that's you're going to send out 
and get a, you know, 80% of the diagno diagnosis back and you still just wait for the RAD to sign on it, but you're going to get the lion's share of the reimbursement, then it starts making more sense too. So I think mm -hmm. to answer my own, contradict myself from earlier, with that happening, we should see it. It just depends on which applications they apply it to. They're, they call it their, you know, you know, advanced software type of thing. And so we're going to have to see where that goes. But I'm, I know they're doing with the heart flow. I know they're going to do it with LMS. But what other systems? There's like body image that, that gives you a great view of the prostate, gives you some numbers for it. You know, there's RSI. I mean, we've all been using brain volume software forever now. If they can give us bigger chunks, that would offset, like I said, what these companies want to charge for it. So I just want to get that in there. I meant to bring that up. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, speaking from the point of view of a radiologist, I, I know this point had been made uh, before we started up, but I know there's always that risk, too, that as you develop shorter sequences and get more rapid acquisition times, then the radiologist very often perceives that to be extra time within the slot that they can add more, add more sequences. So I think it's also important to engage radiologists in this process of understanding what the bottom line business really is so they can really help create and maintain the necessary margin to keep the lights on. But it's just funny how all of this, you, know, you start talking about AI, but it still always goes back to talking about money, right? <laughs> it always it's just it. <laughs> yeah. No matter what, what, what discussion you talk on these trends, it still comes down to that, so. Yeah, yeah and so actually that was a great segue. Thank you, Judith, and I'll let you start <laughs> out there with remote, te remote technology, not necessarily involving the radiologists of ProScan so much, but the outpatient imaging centers they utilize and everything else. Right. Um, this is, I will say, from the accreditation standpoint, this has been a very rapidly burning topic as um, things have been very stressful in outpatient imaging. Staffing has been virtually impossible to maintain in some places. Mm -hmm. um, being able to get qualified technologists who are experienced and capable has been a real challenge. And I very much understand that um, in my role. And I think you are perfect examples of how the companies are using creative methodologies to be and be able to overcome that in some fashion. So how about you, how have you guys been doing it? You know, it's interesting. We've integrated some remote technology into a couple of our imaging centers with great success, which has been interesting. So we know the caliber of the people doing it. And the technology has been there for a long time. So if you're talking about MRI and you're talking about um, uh, service calls from the uh, OEM, they've been remoting in for years and checking on uh, checking on the dynamics and the and the appropriate numbers and the physics of all the equipment that that's being operated now. So it wasn't a real far stretch to have you know uh, uh, MRI certified technologist sitting somewhere and able to do patient monitoring and to do the best exam. I think, I think the early stages of it was going to be for unique exams. So bread and butter stuff, you know, the top three studies in the MRI outpatient world are going to be brain, lumbar, and knee. Uh, maybe it's cervical, lumbar, and knee. Anywho, moving past that, and you're talking about breast imaging or prostate imaging or some liver studies or some dynamic studies, and you think, okay, maybe my tech hasn't been in that hospital base for a while. A remote tech would probably be more qualified from a timing standpoint and and understanding this. So you kind of springboard forward and you think, well, now, now you have a technologist who's super skilled in operating this equipment. You have qualified staff on site for patient screening and patient safety, proper positioning. Does this formula work? And, um, and, it, and it has for us. Um, the patient encounters have been great. Um, the um, support team have been trained. We actually do staff with the MRI tech as well, but our facilities have multiple MRIs. So they're able, they're able to do that and us maintain our standards. Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been good for us. And we, we gave it a good six months try and we're gonna do it again at our locations where we have more than one MRI. And, and it has worked out for us both. And I wanna address your Kevin, both economically, because we're able to staff weekends and we can do evenings and stuff where traditional techs don't have to work that anymore because they're in such high demand. If they just want a straight shift, they can still have the straight shift because we have a backup then. I'm gonna plug Rad side here real quick. Uh, thanks to them being open-minded. I, I think <laughs> we were the 
a company was one of the first ones to start with this because it, it was a did a big part of that. I remember how it started up, and then we went to the ACR. ACR had some wording that really said we could do it because they used the word should versus um, shall or will. And then they ended up <laughs> right after we started it, they went and had a quick meeting and took that word out and replaced it. Right. So <laughs> the RAD site was really open to listening. <clears throat> And saying this is what we want, and here's why. We saw with this is you know it was March of COVID when it first started, and it was we could see where that was going to go, where we were going to have a hard time having people in centers. I mean, you have single parents with a kid now; they don't have a school for their child to go to, so they weren't coming in. And then we could maximize our staff resources and get people doing that, but we didn't just want to do it haphazard. We wanted to go in. We wanted the blessing of of a credentialing company as, such as. Uh, Brad site. And when they worked with us, and, and that really helped it because it, it legitimizes it just as Rad site's now working on some, some other stuff with remote. So it, it was a good thing. I think we wouldn't have survived COVID and patients wouldn't have got the patients won here because they ended up getting care that they wouldn't have got otherwise. As you know, hospitals quit seeing uh, outpatients and things like that. And yet we were still able to do it. We had a couple of places where we would just set up for doing CT chest only for COVID, you know, and they were COVID positive. And we went in. And so, and again, Judith, to go on what you were saying, it was also nice about coming in and helping these weaker techs that, that we're hiring on because of we've lost a lot during COVID, mm -hmm. that just didn't come back to work. And so now we've got an inexperienced crowd. And before you would pay for applications to come out and spend a week. And to use your breast example, they might get two breasts that week to do. Now you just have someone remote in with them when they get the breast and you can do 10, 15 until they feel comfortable. You sign off on it and you have that done. So mm -hmm. they, that or someone's doing an exam that you might do one or two a year and you've got one expert somewhere else. And mm -hmm. so that along a lot of levels, it really does help out, not just on that, uh, you know, but mostly for the coverage and for the education part of it has helped. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the patient that wins because you know, no one wants to get called back for a repeat breast because they know they found something bad and that's why they're coming back. Right. You know, so you really, the best patient care is being provided this way. And again, there was a lot of learning curve on it and we're still in that. We're still making adjustments. We're still having meetings. We're still saying, okay, what can we do to improve this, the communication part and all. So I think it's, it's the way it has to go. I mean, you look at staffing companies that send somebody to rural America somewhere because they can't get a tech to come in and cover. Now you can get somebody, you know, Siemens started that program of theirs where they can kind of come in and do that and, you know, basically virtual staffing. So there are a bunch of uses for it. As you said, we had to find a way as outpatient imaging to make it affordable for us. And that was piggybacking on the um, tech that was already out there. Mm -hmm. And Raymond, I don't know. Uh, how far along or if Acumen actually has even begun with remote technology, but you did such a great job with the AI definition. How do you define what a remote technologist is versus remote technology? And then what are your ideas about what requirements there should be to make sure that a, an adequate level of care is being provided to the patients? Yeah, so there's a there's levels of this, right? Depending on how we're going to use the technology. Um, when I think of remote technologists, there's different levels in there too. Um, how are we going to use and deploy the the um, uh, the the um, uh, process, the standard process, or uh, the information we get back? Um, it's definitely um, I I look at it as okay. We've got this new technology. How do we build around it? How do we make it safe? Um, how do we make sure that we continue the standard of care. Um, and that's kind of where I fit in. Um, deploying the systems itself, getting sites up and ready. I mean, we're doing that at Acumen now. Uh, we're deploying those instruments, uh, uh, you know, all the information, um, uh, making sure that people are trained, uh, tech assistants are trained. That's part of it, that's a piece of it. But putting that all together with standard process, policy and procedure and making sure that we have something really wrapping our heads around scope of practice. Um, when we're talking about 
uh, remote uh, technologists mm -hmm. uh, scanning, there's always a potential where we're going to have that bleed into that gray area, right? Uh, and that introduces risk into the whole scheme of things. Um, so we really need to sit down with you know, key stakeholders when we're deploying all these uh, uh, new uh, protocols and, and, and new equipment and make sure that we really build something solid uh, that mitigates risk, um, that makes sure that everybody has their scope of practice. There's no scope creep, right? Um, everybody knows what their role is in this and that we've been able to standardize care. Um, so all that in a big bucket, um, you know, a, a lot of it, uh, it's kind of easier to deploy it than it is to build all this infrastructure around it to make sure it's safe. Mm -hmm. Not to so, plug Rad's side again, but with them working on credentialing for it, it really is answering a lot of what you're saying. Let's put a standard on it, and you've got to have this standard to do it. And I think that's really putting uh, patient care first by by having a company that recognizes that it is going to become a part of it and let's get it so it could be credentialed just like anything else is to make sure that a quality safe product is being delivered to a patient. And that's 100%. one cool. of the reasons I joined that site was for that very reason. They're very, very patient centric, not to the point of disabling outpatient imaging, but very patient centric. And also I think the people we have involved in RAD site are very forward thinking. And so we're trying to approach these things that are coming up as rapidly as and effectively as possible, both by getting input from people at various sites, from organizational leaders such as themselves. But that's our goal is to make sure that we're as little behind the curve as possible, I guess is the way to put it. So, um, and I think I'd be safe in saying that the three of you don't perceive this to be a flash in the pan. You think this is going to be a real and ongoing thing for yep. perpetuity, probably. Yes. I mean, in radiology in general, I've always felt we've been way behind the curve. I think I always tell somebody I've been doing this same job for 30 years and I've only seen like a two or three year improvement in the, some of the processes. I mean, it's still a patient showing up that doesn't have uh, authorization yet and all of these other hurdles that they put up to limit efficiency at that, that, that that's caused us. But then you go in when radiologists first started reading from home. You know, I've started remote reading themselves. There was a lot of pushback. How can they? They're not going to have the relationships in the clinics. We've been through this before on this, right? Yeah. That was it. Every, oh, that'll never work. It was that that uh, Larry David commercial from the Super Bowl. That technology will never work. So <laughs> well, I think here, and again, right, it's like getting out in front of it and, and <clears throat> becoming a big part of it's going to help because it's going to make it really legitimate and says you got to be within these standards and, and you're well with it. So I just want to throw that in. Yeah, I, I would also throw in that in terms of remote radiologists, the advancement in technology has been great. I mean, once we start getting away from these standalone giant workstations that basically had to be physically located in some cold room somewhere to the point where you could use a standard PC and standard monitors to be able to look at images, that has been a game changer as well. It decreases the cost, the impact of reading from home is way less, and the flexibility goes way up. I completely agree with you. So moving on from technologists to technology, um, this has always been something I've struggled with, even though I've never been the owner of an outpatient imaging chain or anything like that. I've always had great sympathy for the fact that no matter what you do, technology ages, um, new technologies come out. I was lucky enough to train during the period of time where we went literally from doing nothing but x-rays and barium to ultrasound, CT, MRI, helical CT, fast MRI, head CT. I mean, it's been an amazing few years. So I think that the length of time, and I'll let you guys speak to this, the length of time that a piece of equipment lasts seems like it's changed quite substantially over the past few years, but you still have to try and figure out from a business and patient care standpoint, when do you replace it? When do you get another MRI instead of trying to do more patients in one MRI unit? How is it compared to 20 years ago? And are there certain things you look at to make sure that you're making the right decision. Are there hard triggers or is it more like a soft call? I think we'll get more business if we do this sort of situation. So anybody can jump in. Dealer's choice. I think on the when and why to replace, you know, most of the vendors have really started setting 
good upgrade options, right? So that your for MRI, your core magnet's going to stay in there, right? So we know that that can be upgraded to any option. And I think you have to look at it again. If you put an ROI on it, the the time would be okay. We're maxed out here. So if I could switch to a machine and upgrade to a machine, I would have limited time of having to close the center down and tear out a wall and put it in. If I could upgrade it to this higher level and then now I can do 25% more patients then that seems like okay that's a good number then you do your RI best on a quarter you know 25 30% more then that would make sense in in what market you're in what what has become the become a standard like I said when I got into MR you were talking about you know, there's just barium in that but there was no DWI there was no T2 flare in that but what happens is happening now things that are becoming must haves you know, weren't, and some equipment won't do that. So that's when you say, okay, then you're way behind the technology. You can't do the standard of care in a community because you can't provide what, what your referrals are asking for now. So that's one trigger. We can't do that. This software level, this hardware level, that's not an option. So then that's a trigger. Well, then we need to, we have to take it up. Let's look at that and see where to do it. So if the technology is advanced, but your machine can't keep up with it, that's it. And I, I think that's what it comes down to. You know, can you, so to replace, it, it just depends on what level and the cost that it takes to take. Uh, I mean, you can take that 9X, which is one of GE's oldest scanners still out there now, and you can upgrade it all the way to 291. They're artists with a wide bore that they're taking from what was a narrow bore because of the technology that's changed. Cost is still quite expensive. But you can do that now, and so the, but you're saving because you're not tearing out your RF shield. You're not doing all that. So you got to take a, a look into that, and then it, it gives you all the things you could do. Or do we take it up to, you know, let's say with the G to a 26, you know, to a medium, a medium one? Then the cost makes more sense doing that. So it, it's really a lot of it should be, in my assumption, just ROI based. You know, what's our return on that investment in doing that? So. And in, 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 in any given market, what becomes the standard of care? You know, you like I said, doing DWI, it took better gradients and stuff doing it. So some of the base back in the real early days wasn't going to do it. So you had to go up to that next level. It wasn't an option because DWI quickly became a standard that had to be done on every brain. Now right. you look at it, it's really starting to be a big part of body imaging that we weren't using for all that time. So so again, it's. I think it, it's multifaceted. You have to look at, you know, what what you're getting out of it. Where's the technology, and then what the ROI is. Yeah, and there's that sequence creep you were talking about before, too. We look at it a little different, though. So with with that, Kevin, really, <clears throat> when the MIPA standards were the MIPA Act was passed, it kind of leveled the playing field. So, you know, accreditation sets a standard for image quality, which made it very easy for us and our clients to look at this and say, are you going to pass accreditation? That should be that should be the bar. You need to be accredited for image quality. That's one of the that's one of the benchmarks that Ransite uses, which is wonderful. But um, so so like one of our client does 10 MRIs a day on a 15 year old piece of equipment, and their vendor came to him and said, hey, you should do a software upgrade. You could get 20 percent faster throughput, which sounds great. But the question back to the orthopedic practice was, do you have 20 more patients or are you doing everybody in your bed? We're doing everybody in our bed. I said, your image quality is fine. Are you going to capture more patients? And, and the dollar amount was a big, big dollar amount. And so we do, just because you have it doesn't mean they're come. It's not a field of dreams. So, you know, you, so looking at this and saying, hey, what are your, what are your market needs? Are radiologists uh, comfortable still reading them? Image quality doesn't, it doesn't have to be pretty to be diagnostic. And is there a place in your market for some of these advancements? Are you going to capture that? Um, and so, so that's how we kind of look at it a little bit. What is, what is the market demand? Can you capture that patient? And is that going to aid in any, any throughput for you from, for, from a volume standpoint? And I think you'd also brought up, uh, Judith, during our prep session, that point about software upgrades and sometimes getting your equipment from a third-party vendor, whatever it might be, sometimes that becomes not an option any longer. Have you guys run all run into that? 
Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. The OEMs are going to um, they're going to uh, look at you and say, "Hey, go with our service agreements," because then you're on the software upgrade path, which is great. As they have new drops in software, then those are going to be guaranteed, you know, for a small fee. But going through a third party market, they're not going to have access to that stuff. So if you're buying a bread and butter, gently used MRI. That's probably what you're going to have for the rest of its life is that piece of equipment that you have. Unless you can go back to the OEMs, even though you bought it from third party, maybe the OEMs will cover it under service and, and put you in that pathway, but we're not seeing that. Yeah. And Raymond, what's been your experience in terms of longevity of equipment? Has it stayed the same, increased? Is it all software now? I'm sorry. I'm it really is a mix depending on where the system is deployed. Remember some of our, or a lot of our imaging systems are on wheels. So we're moving those from hospital to hospital. We're there for overflow. We're there for the primary MR or PET CT or CT system, whatever. Um, I just, I, I uh, totally agree with Judith and Kevin and their assessment. Um, taking a step back though, when it comes to making that informed decision, when it comes to replacing your equipment, um, I'm a big process guy and a gap analysis on an annual basis for some of your equipment or all of your equipment is the best way to go. I mean, there should be some data. Uh, we should be able to look at that data and make a really good informed decision using a gap analysis. What's current state? Where are we at right now? Where do we want to get? Where are the gaps? And how do we fill those gaps? And when you do it that way and you're kind of a systematic person and getting through it, you get the right team involved. The stakeholders are there. You have roundtable discussion about the entire thing. Um, and maybe you're focused on one system or one department uh, that you're maybe having problems with, but open it up to all your equipment too, I would say, um, and do that gap analysis. And some will find out, or many will find out that maybe it's a training and education thing. We've met that head on at some of our sites where uh, we've got a system that we know is a good system, but it's kind of trailing behind, scan times are long, uh, we're finding out it can't do this or it can't do that. It goes back to training and education for that technologist, right? Mm -hmm. So now we secure that, that, that low cost in the scheme of things, low cost uh, education and training for the technologist. And now all of a sudden it's like we purchased a brand new system because okay. now we're using all the bells and whistles for that system that we didn't even know existed, right? Mm -hmm. So I agree with replacing a unit when it needs to be replaced, but making an informed decision, it's taking a look at everything. And a lot of that is get into your Lean Six Sigma gap analysis type of thing. Uh, and make that informed decision, get the right people around that decision, uh, pull your data, uh, see where you're at right now and see where you want to be or determine where you want to be. Not just the radiologist too. Make sure you bring the lead or main technologist into the whole scheme of things and decision making as well. So that mm -hmm. those are my thoughts. That's how well, we that's a, that's a great message because that's it sounds like you're saying take a very mindful approach to how you're evaluating the equipment, look at everything that touches the equipment to make sure it's working as optimally as possible, and then make a rational decision about what the right thing is to do. That's a great message, a good approach. I'm sure you all do it, but that was well said. And so how is it compared to 20 years ago? I mean, is it better or worse? Do you find it's better to have the equipment you have now than it was to be going to RSNA and buying brand new equipment every two years or? Mm. I think it's definitely changed. I mean, we used to keep our equipment. Um, I, I really think it's depending on, you know, if you're in a large hospital system, you're a venue site for a vendor, of course, you're gonna have all the new ones, new bells and whistles. It really depends on what you're doing. What 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 patients are, your, are you serving? Uh, what exams are you doing? What does your referral base look like? There's so many layers to it to determine when it's time to pull that system out. Um, but what I've seen is, you know, some of the larger hospitals even uh, keeping their system uh, a, a bit longer than they have in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think it's analogous to cars. I mean, back mm -hmm. again, you know, a car used to last around four years, start falling apart. And by 
you know, you, you thought you were great if you were getting seven years out of a car. And now I think that the ex life expectancy of a car is somewhere in that, you know, 14, 15, 16 year range. And people are keeping them on before it becomes on the used market to 12 years. So I think we see that with it. You know, the technology is there, that there is, again, the path, the upgrades, the improvements you can do and stuff like that, that is, as Ray just said, even hospitals are going to hold on to their scanners. If they hold on to them longer, then that decreases the amount of uh, use scanners we can get anyway. So it, it, it all, all of it plays together. Again, if people hold on to it, the used market goes down a little, you're paying more for that, then you get close to, well, then should I go with that new one? Again, it, it's just, it, it's an individual decision each time by what's out there and, and how it's running at that. What can you get? You know, you, you're perusing the websites all the time looking for equipment. There's, there's a good scanner. Let's go with that. That's a good deal still. Or again, if it gets too short, you know, everybody started going wide bore, all of a sudden you couldn't find many wide bores on the used market. So then you right. had to go back to the vendor and negotiate with them and let's let's do that. But now they have narrow bore wide path, I mean, paths to wide bores. So again, it's, it's something that, that really helps and it, it, it comes down to, again, what, what, what can we get out of that? Right, absolutely. So pivoting just a little bit, um, and with the background of the technology and the staffing that we've talked about and everything else, I just wanted to bring up something that we discuss very frequently at RadSite when we have our meetings, that's patient safety. Um, mm -hmm. there, there has been quite a back and forth um, regarding patient safety. As a radiologist, I would say the last time I saw a significant contrast reaction has to have been about 20 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, that having said, if one does occur, I mean, you have to be able to approach that problem in real time and make sure the patient's taken care of. So when we talk about remote technologists and CMS approval of the physician not being on site, but being available, a lot of things that initially, honestly, thing, seemed like they were sort of straining patient safety, in reality, after analysis, and as you said, Kevin, we, we take that sort of analysis very seriously at RADSAI. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, it's, maybe it is okay, or maybe it's not okay. Maybe there's a threshold that we haven't thought of before that makes it okay to change staffing in a way that 20 years ago, people would have said you were crazy. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think things are moving in the right direction in terms of patient safety, or is it staying static, or is it actually degrading? And anybody, I'm sorry, Judith. <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah. So, so when when the PHE, you know, started, obviously they uh, Medicare put in a temporary uh, contrast supervision, remote contrast supervision through like an iPad or an iPhone, to be able to monitor that patient safety for contrasted studies. Now, this is in you know the IDTF set, uh, setting, the independent diagnostic testing facility setting, and then outpatient setting as well. So, you know, so radiologists were allowed to visualize with their phone how that patient was doing. What was interesting to me is, is and I have to think that they did this based on um, methodical um, look backs at MRI contrast reaction, just like you had said, Patrick, over the last 20 years. What was kind of interesting to me is that they bundled ADI in that, so all advanced imaging, so CT as well, where the contrast uh, reaction rate is like 30% higher than an MR1. So that's, that's, that was just kind of interesting to me that they bundled MR and CT contrast under that same umbrella. So the, P, the, the PHE was extended to, I think, January 11th of 2023. So remote supervision by a physician is still going to be in place for another calendar year, which is interesting to me. Um, this summer, Medicare came back and they approved um, APPs, Advanced uh, Physician Providers. So uh, um, um, it would be uh, PAs and uh, nurse practitioners are now able to cover contrast supervision in that setting. Still not approved under the IDTS under the IDTF moniker, but it's it is for mid level. So again, are they did Medicare look at past data on reactions and say, hey, who is able to handle this type of reaction? And it's it's kind of interesting. Now we're with you, Patrick. All of our radiologists are. They they think the same thing in the MRI in the MRI contrast world. 
There's just not a lot of reactions. Um, <clears throat> you know, just a very, uh, you know, very topical approach to it. Um, and and I know that red side addresses what happens if there's an emergency in in this environment. And that that same policy would be in place whether it's a radiologist on site, whether it's a radiologist remote, or whether it's a mid level on site. So I think that patient safety is being addressed in that. It, but again, it is a little confusing to me that they would put CT contrast into that same boat as MRI contrast. But, but I think on that, I mean, if you really look, <clears throat> I mean, if, since we'll say MR is almost non-existent, but CT now is a 0.01 to 0.04 rate of reactions to that and up to 3% are mild, but, th but that lower number is, you know, 0.01 to 0.04 of severe reactions is quite low. I mean, yeah. and you don't see it. And when you do have that, I mean, the, the main thing you're doing is, you know, down on 911 anyway, because you could have a, a physician that's been in practice, a radiologist that's not going to throw stones at them, but they've been in practice and sitting in there in a dark room reading for 30 years. Mm -hmm. If they come out, you know, are they as prepared as they could be, you know, to do that? And I think that having trained staff and, and again, having standards that could be met and well within it, doing it. I think CMS had to have looked at that when they did it, Judy. That's my take on it. You're it's probably because, right on that, Kevin. Yeah. If you really go back and look at it, you know, retrospectively, the number of contrast reactions at CT, it's 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 almost where MR, you would think, would be. It, it got so low. So, yeah, it's, it's still higher. But, but again, the chance of it is, and it exists. It, it, and there's always a perfect storm. Things don't work out. But if you're getting them out, you already have IV access on that patient. You have someone trained, give them this, you know, go to an EpiPen versus having to give a dosage and draw up and do all that. So you're, you can get that set up better, have AEDs available and all the stuff that we should have. But, mm -hmm. but I can tell you, there's not anybody that's going to put a trach down somebody in that study, <laughs> they're going to wait for EMTs to get there to do that. That's yeah. what's going to happen. You're so, right. so even no matter who's doing it, our mm -hmm. response to a contrast reaction from either a physician being on board there or not is going to be the same thing in mind, right? If you're making that. So, you know, the tech should be, you know, or who brings out get, getting that blood pressure, looking at that respiratory rate, looking at that, their, their O2 sats, and then make decisions they can do there as the EMTs are on their way, if it's severe reaction, if it's a mild way, you know, set for 20 minutes and go. So I think CMS had, in my assumption, had to look at that and say, you know what, really, I think we're at that point we can do that now, technology advanced. Again, I was in CATS, you know, graduate x-ray school in 1984. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you would have someone throwing up on almost, it seemed like every contrast reaction in C, or every contrast study in CT or mm -hmm. having hives and, and all that, you would see that. And you just don't see that now like it was. It can happen. And you've got to be, you know, always on watch for that. But mm -hmm. I think if you do the right training, you do exercise uh, drills to, to show people what to do so they don't panic. A master chief in the Navy taught me, always take your own pulse first. <laughs> on yourself down. So I think if we do stuff like that, it, we can really, again, the patient still and ensure patient safety. Yeah. Uh, you know, I find but, it, but again, it comes down to practice and drills and, and education, which you look back to anything that we do here comes back to the education side. Are we training people well enough to handle it if it happens, no matter who it is? Why do you think that Medicare hasn't adopted those same contrast coverage, remote contrast coverage and mid-level coverage for imaging centers then? If the data remains the same, why wouldn't they have put those in the IDTF performance standards? I think it's just a lag, you know, and so much is still, and so much can still be state driven. So even, mm -hmm. you know, California, CMS's rule is still apply, but in a California site, California says you can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. So that becomes, when you look at the states coming in with IDTFs and stuff, you're getting more from there. So you can't forget the state side of it, right? right. In, you got to watch their rules too. So mm -hmm. I think it's a matter, again, if you ask, and I've given this example, are CT reactions uh, in relationship to people that are reaction to shellfish? There is no reaction. There's a yeah. protein that causes one and something else. But if I still ask techs that are trained, 
they still think there's an association there because the old guy that taught them said it happened and they taught the next generation taught no matter what the school said it kept coming down and down again i think so there's that lag catching up to it now of people saying wait a second the contrast isn't my grandfather's contrast, right? It's a whole different thing we're using now. And so I think that's, right. but sometimes the people that are in the positions making those decisions are still old school. They're not out in the real world seeing it as mm -hmm. Dr. Browning was saying when he saw his last reaction. They're not in real world seeing that it does and how it can be handled that way. And I, so I think it takes companies like RadSite educating and working with them to come up with that, being an advocate for the outpatient imaging. I think mm -hmm. it takes, you know, none of us, you know, bigger companies get together and say, wait a second, we really got to lobby and get some changes done in this. It's always been behind and we kind of wait for someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's just nobody been pushing for it. And so I think that's that's something if a lot of practices could at least work together on something and say, you know what, we've got to go up to Washington and say, this is what needs to happen there sometimes. We've got to get a hold and be proactive and not just wait for it to catch up with them because somebody like, you know, went in and said, hey, can they do this now? Like with the virtual supervision, somebody had said, hey, can we do that during the PHE? We can't get coverage. And mm -hmm. then they said, yes. And they said, you know what? This is working. So mm -hmm. it was motivated by the coverage. But then when they went and looked at the numbers, they could see it was there. So mm -hmm. to trickle down to that to be the policy, I was hoping they would just make it be a permanent change, just as restaurants that could give liquor as part of deliveries now you get that in place <laughs> in a lot of places okay so you can still get a margarita to go from your favorite Mexican restaurant so, so it took a while to see that was okay yeah and Raymond had you found with acumen have, how would the radiologists responded to those changes have they been anxious have they been accepting have they been overjoyed no I think it's been good I think it's uh I, I think we're moving in the right direction I think the role of a technologist is different. It's gonna be different. Look what happened with uh, COVID. Um, it tested every standard process we have, policy, uh, you name it. It tested everything to the max. And we're in a new environment, right? So that's what's gonna push this. And when it comes to technologists, they're fully capable of caring for a patient. Um, in a reaction type of situation, as long as, and we heard Kevin mention it, Judith mention it, training and education. Um, mm -hmm. That's gotta be core. They have to know their rules, uh, role and their limitation, right? Um, you know, you go this far and that's it. The rest is 911, the rest is a code team or whatever it might be. Um, but there, we need to be strategic in that training piece and making sure they understand their role and their limitations when it comes to uh, uh, running through this type of thing, caring for the patient. Hey, Kevin yeah. and Ray, with, with your facilities, are you guys doing the remote supervision with your radiologist? Yes, in some okay. cases, not yes. all cases. In some, you. same thing, same answer. Okay. Right. Where it's practical, where it makes sense, you know. Yeah. Right. I mean, you yeah, know, if, you're do, if you're doing arthrograms at a place and you need somebody in doing those, you, yeah. it would be silly to try. You can't get away from that. No, you can't. No. So, so that's just where it's practical. It is. Okay. And surprisingly, the techs were more adaptable to it and gave less pushback than I had expected. I thought it would be, no, we can't do that. But <laughs> you know, when you remind them, like Ray said, they are capable of it. They, you know, they. Mm -hmm. They, they graduated a school, they were a nuke tech or a whatever, they made it through this and through the process. And they have the experience of watching the number of reactions and someone treating it. So now it's just, they're still being told what to do. They're not making a decision on their own. They're, they have somebody with right there with them that's even, you know, we, we do where someone talks to the patient, the, the APP or the physician can talk to the patient. How are you feeling? What's going on? Again, that goes okay. back to how telemedicine and what Ray said, COVID changed a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So you're giving, that's direct access. They would ask them the same questions if they walked in the room, they would tell the, the tech, hey, give them this or give them that, right? right? It's really the same. It's just their presence isn't there. So if they had to do chest compressions, okay, now you're shafted, but let's hope it never gets to that, right? <laughs> Get somebody else doing that until that, and then hope your 911 yeah. team, uh, the first responder is close. So. Yeah. 
I think the, the only thing that we're missing right now when it comes to this new environment is education and training on the front end. So we're seeing techs come to us. We're completing that training. That's, that's in our lap, right? We have to document that training, put that training together, make sure it's annual, make sure it's tied into a competency assessment. All of that stuff is up to us. Down the road, I hope that those training programs, uh, whether it's a college, university, or training program, they will handle that so when these technologists do graduate from the program, they have a really comprehensive knowledge of how to help a patient through this type of reaction, medications, routes, all that stuff, where normally a, 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 a graduate of a rad tech program usually doesn't get that type of comprehensive education. Mm -hmm. and, but then I think that's a gap for right now, I think they're going to close that gap down the road because this is the new role for uh, uh -huh. a technologist. It's going to expand even further, I think, down the road. Mm -hmm. And I think, as was mentioned, one of the confounding aspects is the fact that it's going to vary significantly state by state. So there'll be some states Great. that aren't really going along, they're lagging quite far behind. Other states are going to be more cutting edge and hopefully yep. providing you know good examples for the lag states about how things could positively change. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of touched on all touched on already, but maybe I'll tie this question and also the last slide about you know giving kind of a summary of what your thoughts are going forward. But what has been the uh, the overall staffing and procedure changes? It sounds like from what I'm hearing, they've been pretty seismic. You don't necessarily have to have a radiologist on site anymore. You're now figuring out how you want to train your technologists. You're figuring out how you want to potentially use the various forms of AI and staffing models to be able to approach what looks to be a continued somewhat downward trend in reimbursement for outpatient imaging centers. How has that kind of overall affected the staffing you needed at your various sites, both position and uh, I mean, when you look at what expectations were in December of 2019 to we're getting ready to hit December of 2022, what a difference. I mean, it, it is, and Seismic said, it, 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 it's completely changed. I mean, the, the, again, did we ever think we'd have virtual contrast coverage? Did we think we would be remoting in and having to use that? Did we ever think it would be so hard to find a technologist or a radiologist to come and work? And these are all the things that, that, that haven't changed, but in, in each thing that limitation that occurs makes us think outside the box and come up with another solution. You know. Exactly. Uh, Again, even with like the CMS with the virtual contrast, that's a great thing to do mm -hmm. because it does let a radiologist sit somewhere where they're not being disturbed every few minutes and let them be more efficient since they're less staff to get through and get higher RBUs. So I think that's why it's, it's changed. It's just not, it's what do we look like there and what we look like now, except for the front office and checking in a patient. That mm -hmm. procedure hasn't changed yet. You gotta catch up there. Patients got to walk in and go right to the table. There can't be, you know, you, you didn't know about your copay. You didn't know about the right. authorization, you know, the authorizations and in insurance company, pet peeve of mine, because <laughs> if I have back pain and I go to the doctor, he's going to put me on anti-inflammatories or whatever treatment, but he wants me to get an MRI. Let's make sure it's nothing worse. Well, if I'm six days, seven days out getting that authorization, I've been on ACEDs or even anything for that period of time, I'm feeling better. Do I want to spend part of that copay? And copays and deductibles are so high now. Do I want to spend that money? But my back's feeling better. I don't need to do that. And that doesn't mean it wasn't there. My headache's gone. That doesn't mean whatever was causing it wasn't still there. So I think they build delays into, because I heard somewhere like, you know, they approve almost everything that goes up for off. So it can only be in my assumption a delay. So I think we still need a lot of catching up to do with it. But the staffing and procedure changes as far as once you get through that door, they're a 180 from what, they, not a 180, they're just, uh, they're just so new. I mean, it's, it's just different. It, it's changed it that much. Um, mm -hmm. Who we, who you hire and who you keep on and trying to educate has changed so much that you're, you know, it's made it really challenging, but it's it, slowly we're adjusting to that. You know, we're adjusting our game how the game's changing and, and, and we're just playing a little bit of catch up on it now 
but we're getting there. And I think the people on this call all understand that and, and are doing this. And Raymond, what are your thoughts as far as what sort of staffing changes or procedure changes there have been and how do you see it going in the future? So uh, with, with COVID, I think uh, if there's any positives out of COVID, it's gonna be a cause that's to be more agile, right? Um, and when it comes to staffing, um, you know, huge changes. I mean, we went down at some sites with less staff, of course, and we tried to operate like we did before. That doesn't work, right? Um, you need to go back to your standard processes and figure out what will work now that we only have one technologist, or maybe we had four and we've got two now. How are we gonna make this work? How, again, how are we gonna keep that standard of care for each of our patients, keep everybody safe, including the field, right? Including our team members, our technologists. How are we gonna keep everybody safe doing this? Um, so I think th that made us uh, sit down and kind of rip the Band-Aid off and really dissect process um, and, and, and standards uh, and, and get back to business. So definitely cause us to be more agile. Mm -hmm. And Judith, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with the guys on this. We have gone a little bit deeper on our front office team and uh, putting plug and plays in place like uh, patient scheduling themselves and then addressing interoperability and patients access to medical records. And um, we saw a dynamic shift from uh, pre-op being almost a manual process to close to 90% of it being done online and, and being bought, which has created some efficiencies for us, which is which is good. But, you know, our, our front office team and our pre-op team um, have to be very, very skilled at uh, computers now. I mean, they're working within two, three, four different systems, the PACs, the RISC, the EMR, the patient scheduling piece, the, um, uh, the uh, money management, the accounting part of it, the insurance part of it. It's, it's a complicated position for people to have. And so we're, we're finding challenges hiring, uh, hiring people that are like, hey, I'm so good at all of these systems. That's been, that's been uh, an issue. So we're trying to get our arms around a robust training program for that as well. Which again, creates its own level of staffing issues and hiring issues and everything else. Truly, absolutely, truly, yes, yeah. Well, I really wanna thank all three of you for taking the time and making the effort to, to help educate the people who have attended and those who will see the webinar over the course of the next year. And thank you both, all three of you so much. I really appreciate it. I wanted to see if there are any attendee questions real quickly in our last couple of minutes. I personally think you all did an amazing job. Um, I think that one of the hardest things that I saw anybody do was just try and keep an outpatient gym engineering center up and going um, during a dramatic downturn in volume, um, staff potentially leaving or getting sick um, and having to leave. I think that was an, an incredibly stressful time, but I also do know that very often that sort of stress ends up creating a better system. And maybe there are things that weren't thought about before that end up being put in place. And in the long run, everything's better. As much as I think the pandemic was a disaster in many ways, I'm hopeful that working with you all and working with Bradside, we'll be able to eventually get to a better place where we're doing better patient care and better imaging. Well, Bradside's a, a phenomenal organization to be affiliated with, and you did a wonderful job moderating this, Patrick, so thank you. Oh, good. I'll give you, I'll give you the $20 after. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I thought Kevin said there was a margarita. <laughs> yeah, they, sorry, at RSNA, at RSNA. <laughs> there it is. Because I will be there. Um, as part of right side, I assume the three of you will also be there as part of your organizations. Or... Yep, I will definitely be there. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, Raymond's going. Officially offering to buy you a margarita after one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and sign off. There are no questions that I see, and I will turn it back over to Julie. All right, Radsite would like to say thank you to all our moder to our moderator Patrick Browning. And our panelists, uh, Raymond Friedenstein, Kevin Oliver, and Judith Turner. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available 
through our website, along with recordings of past sessions. I want to thank you all for being part of today's roundtable, and we hope you will continue to join us for our upcoming webinars. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.